Hello everyone, my name is Tanya Zuk. I'm a PhD candidate here at Georgia State University in the School of Film, Media, and Theater. I'm going to walk you guys through what I call a mini lecture in my online and blended courses. I'm going to talk to you guys today about visual design for pedagogical structure, accessibility in teaching visual arts online, and blended approaches to the asynchronous synchronous debate. So I've been using Word and I've been using their templates, and in particular their newsletter template, to create my syllabi, which allows me to use graphic design principles to create a hierarchy of knowledge um, and information for students that they're used to parsing, because it's similar to magazines, textbooks, web pages, um, mediums that they're familiar with and they understand how to navigate and um, how that structure works, because they use it every day. Newsletter template is great in Word because you can select your color scheme, drag and drop your images, copy and paste your information into the respective boxes, and it does all the formatting for you. So there's not as much um, labor involved as you would think in creating a document like this. For example, I have up here my Authors and Genres, the Gothic class. Um, and you can see that I have an image that I've used and a color scheme. And my first call out box is over here on the left for my contact information, because in the end of the day, 90% of the time that students are going to the syllabus to look up how to get a hold of me. As you scroll through, we have a different style call out box, because then the second thing that people want to know, generally speaking, is how much is this assignment worth and how do I get an A? We go into course policies, um, accommodations, etc. And then we find our next call out box. It's a different color and it's a different location on the page. This is a visual cue for students that, oh, this is a different content, um, but it's important content. And as we scroll through, the same location, the same color scheme, and so we know it's the same um, general concept going from one page to the next. Um, these are all the different assignment sketches as far as like what's, a, what's going to be considered important for them going forward. The third thing that we see here is we have a new color um, and a new style, and so therefore a new topic. And this is something that I started including this, this past semester, um, which is tips for success. Most of our students um, have only learned face-to-face -face prior to coming to college and weren't intending to learn online. Um, this is a situation of COVID-19 um, impacting our, our pedagogical process. And so they've not been taught how to learn online. And so we need to enroll those types of tips and structures into um, our existing documentation. Uh, because they don't know. Just as much as we're learning how to teach online, they are learning how to learn online. And so I provide um, some very fundamental um, tips in my syllabus and a whole section in my first week on, hey, here's some information that's going to be useful for you for learning online since that's what we're doing right now. School schedule, the class schedule. Um, this class schedule is vitally important. Um, because it clearly outlines what content is going to be in the asynchronous online discussion forum and what's going to be in our synchronous Zoom sessions or um, WebEx sessions. This class is also hybrid and so we meet two or three times during the semester to play games in person um, and those dates are also outlined here. I discovered going through the semester, um, probably week three or so, that I need to create a schedule that's specific to each group um, so that if they're expected to be in class on Tuesday, show and tell shows up on Tuesday. If they're expected to be on um, the discussion forums on Thursday, then discussion forums on Thursday, right? This is my Gothic image. It's the old haunted mansion. And this image and the color palette that I've chosen for this particular template is incredibly important when it comes to the design part of my class because it provides students with a quick visual identifier. Oh, that image goes with the content. This is syllabus. So this is therefore Gothic. Um, so they know what class they're in. 
Um, when you're in a physical environment, most students know what topic they're talking about, not because they've memorized the syllabus or even have it looked up, but because they know what room they're in. Oh, I'm in Langdale Hall. I'm on the third floor. I must be taking Spanish right now um, or whatever. And so part of what the syll syllabus does, and it continues on into my iCollege classroom, is that it provides that visual cue of, oh, I must be in Gothic right now. Um, for us as instructors, one of the great things is that if you have multiple sections of the same class, choose a different image or a different color palette for each section, and it'll make it very clear to you from the first glance. You don't have to look any farther. Oh, that's the wrong section. Let me pick a different syllabi. Um, or from one year to the next. So I mentioned that color and that image. When you come into iCollege, there's that image again. So the syllabus matches the thing they're going to click on in their homepage on iCollege. And then one more time, it's the header for the class. So everywhere they go in iCollege, they're going to see this header. And the, everywhere they go in iCollege in my class, they're going to see this header. And it's going to visually reinforce we're talking about gothic. We're talking about scary, creepy things here right now. Um, and help them through that. In addition to those elements that pull from the syllabus into iCollege, um, I use announcements pretty extensively, at least once a week. And I incorporate media content into that, whether it's poster design and links out to things, or if it's memes, um, that are regional specific. This is the Gothic Waffle House. Um, it connects back to the content, but also to the technical aspects of the class, right? So for this case, final project outlines. Earlier on in the semester, it is literally walking them through all of the aspects of iCollege that I think is important to them. And finally, when we go into the content area, the last graphic element that I use for pedagogical structure is of course um, their weeks. I don't use containers for types of content, readings, screenings, assessments, so on and so forth. Instead, I do it by the week in which we are in for the class. So if we go to Modern Gothic, the third week in my class, you'll see that we have online labeled. We're gonna be doing this online discussion um, and it's American Horror Story, which matches up with their um, syllabus and then we have our show and tell assignment which is Crimson Peak and it's very clear what's connected to what. So these are some fundamentals of graphic design that can help with our pedagogical structure and keeping students on track. We've all had to make some drastic changes pedagogically with the transition to online learning in the pandemic. One of those areas is in how we treat um, accessibility and accommodations. We all know in a face-to-face -face environment that we deal with accommodations per student at that time. So if we have, we only create the accommodation when the student is present in the classroom and needs it. So we only have an ASL interpreter in the classroom or closed captions in the classroom or um, creating allowing for double time for exams when a student needs it. We assume that the student, all of our students are able-bodied until proven otherwise. In an online environment, the reverse is true. According to the American Disabilities Act and federal law, we have to assume that there's someone um, with the disabilities in our classroom from the get-go as part of the instructional design of the course. And this means changing some of the ways we approach creating content. However, those changes don't have to be hard or particularly onerous. For example, here in iCollege, um, we, we need to use headings and paragraph styles for screen readers and image descriptions for screen readers. This is a very easy change for us. When you're creating a file in iCollege, instead of bolding and italicizing and changing the font, we highlight that area and we change the heading style. 
from paragraph to heading one or two or three, whatever you feel like looks the best, or goes chronologically. So for mine, this is a major heading. It's the one below the page heading, which is overview. So it's going to be heading two. And that goes through all the way down. And then when I have a subheading, like your expectations of me, it's header three. By doing this, it allows for screen readers to tab through like other people scroll through to find information that they're looking for. The second area is adding image descriptions to every image you upload. It is tempting to upload an image. In this case, I'm going to do my biopic and say, this is an image is decorative because it's not particularly important information, right? It's not like this is instructional information. But for students who have to use a screen reader for access, having alternative text, even for decorative images, lets them feel included in the visuals that everyone else is seeing. So it behooves us for outreach, for accessibility, um, for inclusiveness, to include that alternative text for the screen reader. And it can be as simple as close-up of the instructor smiling. That's enough. Now they know what that picture was of. And there we go. So these are small, simple things that we can do to add um, accessibility to our courses online. The next area that I want to talk about is videos. Every video, and this is particularly important for our, us in the arts, every video needs to have closed captioning or um, a transcript. Every video. This can become quite onerous to do by hand. However, there are a variety of products out there that will auto caption content for you. I use Screencast-O-Matic, it's what I'm using to create these videos, but you can use WebEx, you can use Zoom, even PowerPoint now does auto-captioning, um, and you can record a PowerPoint and it will auto-caption whatever you're talking about. Um, but having that closed caption and or transcript is essential for students who are who need it. And even for students who don't need it, um, it can be very useful if you have an accent or if their English is not their first language. Um, and so it behooves us to do that. Is it a little bit more time consuming? It can be, but it's the law. <laughs> um, it's good pedagogy uh, to have it available. It's the curb cutout effect, right? Everybody will use it. Um, just some people absolutely need it. Last, um, we have PDFs. Um, if you're anything like me, use quite a few PDFs in teaching, um, and most of them are not handicap accessible. They're not screen read accessible. Uh, and so we've now included uh, accessibility markers um, in iCollege. And if you click on these, lovely bad boys, they will tell you, okay, here's some of the things that you need to do. Um, and how to fix it. I went through and did it for me um, already. You'll notice that I have, these ones are green, they've passed muster, the screen reader can use them. This one is not, but that's okay because it's not for them, it's for me. Um, but that's one way that you can tell if something is done right um, and has that accessibility. Um, so here on campus, we have the Access and Accommodation Center. You can reach out to them and they'll help you with that. You can use library course e-reserves to allow your students to have access to PDFs that are able to be screen read. Um, and of course, there's the iCollege accommodation indicators here that will walk you through some of the step-by-steps to making your course more accessible and in an online environment. There's been a lot of talk um, among educators about what approach is the most advantageous for students to learn online. Doing everything asynchronously on your own and submitting assessments on your own or 
trying to do something like Zoom where you're running your entire lecture like you would normally in a face-to-face -face environment um, at the same time with your students, right? Um, ultimately, we were never in a fully synchronous system. In a face-to-face -face environment, we had a blended model. Online, for me, is no different. I mix half of my class is asynchronous content to be done on your own time, and the other half is synchronous content. Both my classes, one a truly hybrid and the other one a fully online class, as blended courses. And I do this because it provides the most modalities for students to learn. They have text, they have images, they have videos, and it has the most um, interactions available to them with me and with other students. So this blend of asynchronous and synchronous um, teaching methods requires one key factor that I found, and that is breaking your classes down into smaller groups. Without groups, this whole thing falls apart on a lot of different levels. And when you come to discussion forums, there are 87 posts in this particular discussion forum. I have some that are over 150. It is unrealistic for us to assume that students will read through 150 posts and comments. It becomes busy work at that point. There's too many, too much content available to them for them to sift through and figure out whose ideas are things that they would respond to well or they agree or disagree with. In addition to all of the regular content. And this is where groups become invaluable. So if you scroll down here, I broke my groups into to four. So there's 10 people in a group. Randomly. Now I have maybe 15 posts here to read. As a student, this creates a couple of things. One, it reduces this from being busy work meant to keep them churning out assessments to an intimate conversation that has meaning, um, that is reasonably obtained. And the second, it provides an easy way for me to grade whether or not they've done the content because um, I've attached a rubric to it. So it's click, click, click some overview and there we go. Um, and this works out really well. The other thing to remember is the groups are useful for um, synchronous content as well. For my Gothic class, they're becoming discussion leaders in our Zoom session. So much like for our online discussion, I come up with media clips and discussion questions and monitor the discussion in online forums. Um, they're doing the same for the Zoom session. So they've all signed up for um, a theorist, uh, a theory, and they have to come up with their own clip um, or media content and discussion, introduce it and discuss some questions for the class that link the reading, the movie that they watched for class and their new media clip. Um, by making the Zoom sessions an integral part of the pedagogy for the class, um, it makes it a way for them to bring their own creative input and their interests into the classroom. Um, it allows them to ask questions of each other and become interactive with each other. And it's less of a formal environment um, as me lecturing out to them, but a conversation that we're all having together. So that's the end of my spiel. Um, these are three major components to my teaching online that I think are useful to other people.